Welcome to Laurier's Teaching Excellence Conversation Series. I'm Mary Wilson, Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning at Wilfrid Laurier University. Today, I'm with Colin Laverty from Laurier's Faculty of Music, who received the 2022 Early Career Excellence Award in the part-time category. Colin is a passionate student-centered educator who creates a thriving classroom that empowers students to build the skills they need to bring music into their own communities. His work to incorporate more diverse musicians and indigenous knowledges has had an impact beyond his own classroom. And Colin has worked to make the music curriculum more inclusive. I'm thrilled to be able to talk to Colin about his approach to teaching. So let's revisit the conversation that we had started about the connection that you see between theory and practice and conservative conservatory music traditions and that educational structure mm -hmm. and how it prepares students for the study of music at the university level mm -hmm. uh, and where your teaching practice intersects with that understanding of that very sort of rigorous conservatory model? Mm -hmm. um, well, because I, uh, I came up as a composer, even though we are all, we're still in the com conservatory model, uh, we also have this, um, you know, we're learning about creativity as well. And uh, I came up as an, as an improviser. And so my practice in the classroom is to try to find ways to bring in especially my improvising practice and what that usually looks like um, as we were kind of talking about before, is it's kind of um, being prepared, knowing what you want to talk about, knowing what points that you want to hit, um, knowing what you want your audience to, to leave with, as you pointed out, which I think is really astute, really focused on, if nothing else, what are they walking out of the classroom with? And having the big structures in place, um, but also being able to step outside of that structure when you need to, and to be able to, um, connect with your, your classroom, which often means getting out of your head a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, often if I'm too planned, if it's too structured, and my intuition is because I'm a planner, I want to know every word I'm going to say, especially as a composer, because we tend to, we tend to work out um, everything ahead of time. We try to get everything down to the last detail. And so my intuition is to want to have everything worked out to the last detail. But from improvising, I've learned that sometimes those best moments, the, the magic moments in the classroom, they're rarely from when you're reading a PowerPoint. They're rarely from your, when you're sticking to your notes. It's usually when you uh, take a bit of a risk and put yourself out there a little bit and, um, and take the class somewhere where you're not totally sure where it's going to go. Uh, and I think if you're in tune with your students, sometimes there are those opportunities for like a line of flight that you might see, yep. um, and you, you think somebody might say something, and if you're, if you're tuned in your classroom, because I think when you're reading from notes, sometimes that's what happens, is you kind of put the blinders on and you're not, you know, there's a bit of a veil between you and your students. So if you can kind of stay in tune with your, your students and where they're at, you'll notice when somebody says something and you can see the room kind of respond to that question, and if sometimes just diving into that question head first, you'll feel the room come alive versus sometimes when you're just, you know, reading off a PowerPoint or sticking to your notes, um, you'll see them, you'll see the eyes maybe glaze over a little bit, especially if it's a morning class. Um, at the same time, if you're not prepared at all, I mean, you can't just do everything off of the, off of the cuff, uh, or at least I can't all the time. I find that that doesn't work either because sometimes it can, it can get a bit jumbled and the students don't have a sense of where are we going and what are we trying to learn and what are we trying to accomplish. So it's trying to strike that balance between uh, um, the big pillars of what you're trying to get across with some room for, for maneuvering a little bit. Yeah, it, it is uh, very much in keeping with my experience as well. When I was a graduate student uh, teaching in, at that time uh, I was studying English literature and I remember scripting all of my seminars mm -hmm. uh, down to the last word and practicing what I was going to say. And then I'm bound up in all of that intentionality and all of that uh, preparation rather than being present with the students or knowing how they're responding because I can't pay attention to them the mm -hmm. same way 
when I'm focused on uh, more of a, a teacher-centric uh, approach to the course development. Uh, and when I uh, really shifted that, it was a consequence of participation in something called the Instructional Skills Workshop. Uh, which is something that Laurier has traditionally offered as well. Historically, it's, um, it's something that was created in Canada and is now international and hundreds of educators around the world have gone through the ISW model. And they um, promote a, a very simple framework for thinking about lesson planning that's based on what they call BOPS, which talks about uh, a bridge in to help students sort of reacquaint themselves with where the course has been most recently, and the intention of the time that's gonna be spent together that focuses on the outcomes or the objectives and then has um, some form of participation and reflection and engagement bound up in it and then a summary of what was learned um, so that the students can reflect and kind of connect things a little bit better. And once I started observing that framework as a model for thinking about how I am in my classes as an educator with that primary focus, as you were saying, on what do I really want my students to be able to take away from our time together today? Mm -hmm. That made it a big difference. I also uh, really appreciate what you're saying about how to um, help students to cultivate the, the ability for improv and, and creativity. And some of that, it sounds as though it comes from things that you're deliberately doing to model and scaffold. Do you, do you talk them through it as well? I do, yeah. So um, it's tricky because, like, um, I'm I'm wary of also like of over theorizing things, uh, which is uh, it's ironic because I teach theory, music theory. I love theory. I like thinking about these things. I like analyzing and picking apart and understanding. Um, but a lot of it for me is also just modeling um, the behavior. So I think when students see what you're doing, they pick up on it in an intuitive way. Um, so sometimes I think if you, if you over theorize, you can get that kind of scripting happening with your students a little bit. And sometimes it's just um, being the behavior that you want that, to, that you want to impart on them, and they'll pick it up uh, intuitively. It's difficult to quantify, but I'm also uh, I'm very uh, I like to think meta, and I'll often comment on while I'm, what I'm doing while I'm doing it. I almost can't help it because you know, I like having those conversations with students. And I think one thing that um, students really value is transparency. And uh, probably some of the biggest complaints that I hear from my students, you know, if they're talking about um, just their experience in university and what's working for them and what's not, one of the biggest things that you hear is just um, when things aren't clear in either in the, the curriculum or the syllabus or the classroom, mm -hmm. and when it's not clear what's going on or where it's going or that maybe the, the um, teacher isn't being um, as forthcoming as they could be. So uh, I try to be very transparent. And if I, if I do take a line of flight in the classroom, I'll often talk about what I'm doing while I'm doing it. And the students seem to um, respond to that. They seem to latch on and understand. And, and it, it, I suppose it's, it um, shows them how I'm thinking about my teaching, how I'm thinking about the classroom environment and what I'm trying to do. Um, you can go too far with that a little bit. You can get a little bit too. Uh, uh, in your head or, or heady about it or um, mad about it or whatever, but I find that when I do a bit of that, the students really seem to appreciate it, especially since I do have some students that are interested in education. And so I right. think that they appreciate um, seeing how a teacher thinks about their teaching in real time. Well, I think particularly for students when they're novice in the discipline or field and they don't understand the entire expanse and boundary of it. Mm if you're able to make the tacit explicit for them mm -hmm. and help them to understand the why of what you're engaging with and how and what your expectations are for their demonstration of learning and also helping them to understand what is um, sort of a, a, a mature or robust expression of that learning and what is more along the sort of scale of development. Mm. That just helps them to navigate that space more comfortably and it gives them that self-reflection that they need as well to, to gauge their, their own progress and invest in their own learning in a more important way. So I think it's, it is a good reminder for all of us as educators to pay attention to where our students are mm -hmm. in that arc of discovery and understanding mm -hmm. of discipline. And as they advance, to let them interrogate it mm -hmm. and, and trouble it a little bit more is, is also, I think, a really important thing to do. Yeah, that's a good point. I think one of the, the hardest things to do well in the classroom is 
uh, making space and holding space for students in the right kind of ways for, and giving them the space to explore. And, and so I sometimes think about teaching more as facilitation than maybe the, the old way of thinking about um, how I hold all the knowledge and I'm going to you know, impart it to you, especially with the internet, because there's so much access to, to information. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot about um, Don Morganson, for whom the awards were named for, and to me, he was one of the best uh, at doing that. And I'll never forget, he had this, there was one class where he was talking about education specifically, and it was in the context of a psych class too, but he was talking about education. And it's sort of off the cuff, he was talking about how to him, traditionally education has been, all the students hold a little bag, and the student, come, the teacher comes around and just like drops stuff in the bag. <laughs> yeah. And at the end of the term, the student goes up to the teacher and dumps out their bag. And he said, "What? Like, what are we doing if that's if that's education?" Granted, there are certain disciplines where I feel it does have to to be that way. But in the arts, that's not the really the model that that I'm interested in. And and to me, Don sort of hit it on the head when he was talking about that. Yeah, like yeah. Yates says, you got to light a fire, not fill a pail. Yeah, yeah, for uh, sure. So. I, I know that in your package as well for the teaching award, one of the things that really stood out was the work that you're doing around inclusive teaching practices and inclusive curriculum. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your commitment to that mm -hmm. and how you're bringing that into your teaching practice? Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer. Every single person um, deserves to be treated with a basic human integrity and respect, and um, I can't even understand how that's a, a question. The question is, how do you do that at a curricular level? Because um, it's it's tricky, you know, when you are dealing with high level um, uh, or higher order elements like designing a syllabus or designing a curriculum or designing a program or designing an entire university education. Um, there are a lot of factors, and it and it gets it gets messy. Yes. What I do in the classroom is I really try to meet every single person as an individual, and just treat them with respect. I try to set a tone in the classroom that it's fine to question and we're gonna disagree and we should disagree. There has to be room for disagreement in the classroom because we're, we're working through difficult concepts sometimes, but there is a way to, dis to disagree respectfully. Um, and so any kind of disrespect or bullying or anything like that, I just don't tolerate. And I'm quite, I think, um, I'm quite kind as a teacher and I'm quite understanding and um, I have a, a, a soft touch with the students. But when it comes to respecting the classroom, that's where I'm a little bit, I'm firm. I just, I don't tolerate it. And um, if I see it in the classroom, I'll, um, I mean, I won't call it out, um, but I'll, I'll deal with it and I'll deal with it quickly. Um, one thing, um, I mean, the other thing with individuals is um, I, I do think you have to meet them as individuals because there is a risk of, of Tolkienism. You know, if we're talking about issues around race, for example, I've heard stories of um, instructors who are well-intentioned who might call on a student uh, of color, um, and that student may not want to be the representative um, for, for their race. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the level of the individual um, comes in, and really knowing your students and getting to know your students one-on-one, -on -one, having conversations with them before class, having conversations with them outside of class, understanding who they are, what are their values, um, what are they interested in, because everybody's different. Everybody has different goals. Everybody has different ideas. So um, in the classroom, it's really understanding. I take the time to learn their names, which isn't easy in a classroom of 50 people, but uh, I make a point to, to learn their names and to uh, look them in the eye when we're in the class, um, to really try to pay attention to what's going on in the dynamics of the classroom, because there are things that are happening all the time when you're teaching that may or may not have to do with what you're teaching. So just trying to always keep the temperature of the room um, and checking in. Um, and so the, to me, sometimes the time before class and after class is some of the most valuable um, because that's the time where you can just wander around the room and, hey, how's it going? You know, what's up? Um, and giving them space to be honest and be themselves with you, um, which often is just being kind and being understanding and holding space and listening. And so um, as an instructor, I think uh, listening and as musicians, you know, listening is, uh, is one of the most important things that we do. So learning how to listen. And, and being relentlessly invitational, mm -hmm. uh, I think is also what I'm hearing from your approach to doing this. I imagine you start with your very first class uh, to lay the groundwork for that. Do you, do you work with the class to talk through shared expectations 
for the tenor of conversation, for how they're going to commit to working together as students and to make sure they understand that you're being authentic when you're Absolutely. saying that you're available. Yeah, and even one of my colleagues started doing a bit of, um, like draft drafting of a document, almost like a contract for the class, and just to, to say explicitly, here are my expectations for the, the tone of the, the classroom or the tenor, as you put it, which I, I really like. A um, little music, music term there for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah, absolutely, 100%. Yeah, you're in an absolutely brilliant period of time in terms of educational literature around pedagogies of care, which sounds very core to your practice mm -hmm. as an educator. There is a book out called Relationship Rich Education mm. that was based on quite a massive study of what makes a difference for students in terms of their encounters with each other, with faculty members, for their persistence, for their academic success, for their depth of uh, achievement in their disciplines, uh, their aspirations for themselves subsequent mm -hmm. to education, uh, and also just um, folks like we, we have a speaker coming in this fall mm -hmm. uh, who's doing work in the U.S. around um, pedagogies of care and, and compassion, mm -hmm. uh, and there are a number of articles internationally, um, people like Robin DeRosa and um, Maha Bali and um, a number of different educators right now. So it's a, it's a great time to be mm -hmm. doing this kind of work. I'd love to see you doing some research and publication in this area yeah. uh, out of what you're doing as a, as a matter of course in your course and curriculum. Mm -hmm. how, how is it that you have learned what you now understand as an educator? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, just on the ground. Um, I think, uh, again, as a musician, um, and as somebody who um, oddly, like, although I like the theory and I can be very cerebral, I learn best when I'm working with my hands. And I remember even as a kid, um, when I wanted to learn, um, someone would try to show me and I would usually very stubbornly say like, okay, that's great, let me, let me try it, let me experience it. So it was very much experiential learning. And so um, I, I learned by doing, and I learned by uh, a little bit of trial by fire and just um, throwing my feet to the flame uh, on purpose, even though I know it makes me uncomfortable and still uncomfortable to this day. I still get a little nervous before every single lecture um, because uh, I've gotten good at doing, putting myself in situations where I'm not 100% comfortable because I know that there's value there and I know that that's how you learn. Um, I remember I had a, um, there was a friend of mine who um, I was trying to convince him to, to speak at a graduate conference when we were graduate students. And he said, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll do it when I'm ready. I'm just, I'm not quite ready yet. And I, you know, I just wanted to grab him and say, you're the, the best thing that you're gonna, the best way to learn is to just go and, and do it and you'll fail and it will be terrible and it's not gonna feel good. But that's, you'll learn more in, in those moments of just being in front of an, uh, an audience, even if you fail, you're gonna learn more in doing that, in my opinion, at least for me. Um, so I really try to put myself in situations where there's going to be experiential learning, and then I support it with the theory after the fact. So even with instruction manuals, I tend to go and just, I mean, when you get an instruction manual, you don't just sit down and read it front to back. You tend to do the thing and then like, oh, how do I do this? And you go and find it. And so that's how I sort of treat the theory as well as I go and do, and I'll think, I keep noticing this thing happening in the classroom or, or um, whether it's modes of assessment or methods of assessment, like I'm noticing that this, this you know, assignment or whatever isn't quite landing in the way that I want to. And that's when I go to the, the teaching instruction manual or the, the theory to try to understand what it is. And then it tends to resonate more deeply when you have that experience, when you've got that intuitive sense in your body of what it feels like to be in that moment, all of a sudden the theory for me makes more sense. Um, and it comes out in my teaching as well. I tend to do a bit more of a flipped classroom where I want them to have the experiential learning supported by theory um, rather than the other way around. When you're reflecting on your teaching practice and what's happening in your classroom, do you intentionally carve out time during the week to think about how a lesson plan went or how an assessment went or conversations with students during office hours or hallway conversations? Or is it more dynamic than that? I take a lot of notes at the end of my lectures. Uh, I'm not always good at it, but um, in a perfect world, I'm taking notes after every single lecture because I think after my first year of teaching, when I taught the same class for a second time, I went back and you know, um, uh, 
when I first did the class, I remember having a thought, you know, like, oh, I, I, it was an observation of how things went. And I thought, oh, I'll remember that for next time. <laughs> and then a year goes by, or eight months, or whatever it is, and then I was like, wait, what was that thing? I noticed that, it, you know, my memory's not great around that stuff. So I started keeping notes after every lecture, even just a couple of notes, whatever it might be. And then when I revisit that lecture the next time, I can remember, um, even if it's just there, I see like, oh, yeah, this is what I was thinking about. This is what worked. This is what didn't. So I'm a tweaker. So I'm always trying to tweak. And um, yeah, I would say after, uh, usually once a week if I can, or if not after every lecture, to just sit down and reflect on some of the things I noticed that week or in the classroom and just uh, almost like journaling. And um, one of the things we do in the community music um, uh, department especially is to encourage students to journal because uh, there's, you know, the research shows how valuable that is. And so I try to do journaling. This is kind of my teaching version of journaling, um, even to just write it down. Even if you don't revisit it, the act of writing it down and putting it on paper um, is uh, really valuable. So I, I try to do that as much as I can. Yeah, that is great advice uh, yeah. to share. So the, you are an early career teaching award winner mm -hmm. and you're already so accomplished. Mm -hmm. When you think about the long road ahead as an educator and your opportunities for growth and development. What excites you the most? What are you most interested in pursuing right now in your educational practice? I mean, what ex excites me the most is always the, just the students. Um, and I mean, I had a great experience at university. It was one of the most profound experiences I, uh, I ever had. And I was really fortunate that I had um, a couple of really good mentors along the way. And in music, we're especially fortunate because we get so much one-on-one -on -one time on our instrument, um, or in, in my case as a composer, I had one-on-one -on -one composition lessons with a, with a professional composer, um, you know, someone who was, uh, was doing the work or a few people that were doing the work. So I was really, really fortunate to have that, that mentorship. And it was that relationship, the relationships that always, in hindsight, that was the most valuable thing. Um, I mean, with, uh, with colleagues as well, but in terms of faculty, I, I like the relationship with students. Um, that's where I get um, most of my energy is just seeing them connect the dots and helping to facilitate that. And for me, that's always number one. And because the experience was so profound for me, if I can, if I can help, it sounds like a cliche, but it's true. If I can help students do that, if I can give them a good experience in university that's meaningful, um, to me, that's, that's always a top priority. So as an extension of that sentiment, what do you most want for Laurier um, when it comes to our, uh, our teaching practice collectively mm -hmm. and our priorities for education over the coming years? To be relevant in our community um, and to help produce um, citizens that are um, informed and that are um, doing um, good work that helps our communities and helps people around us. Um, and uh, yeah. That's a, a wonderful answer. The community music program at Laurier teaches students, among other things, to collaborate with both musicians and non-musicians in making music. Can you comment a little bit around uh, how to get non-musicians involved in music and what you're hoping for in the community music program? It's about connection uh, and it's about um, relationships and, and relating to people. So when working with non-musicians, um, non um, depending on the context, you know, there's still some goal in music is kind of the vehicle to help get there. So whatever it might be, whether it might be uh, rehabilitation, whether it might be shared experience, whether it might be whatever it might be, uh, to me, music is just the, the conduit through which um, to get there. So. As an educator, it's still thinking through um, what do I need to do um, to uh, get, or what am I trying to leave with, with the people that I'm working with? Um, and it's a little bit of a change in mindset maybe because when you're working with musicians, you know, maybe we'll delve into the theory a little bit more. Whereas when you're dealing with, with non-musicians, sometimes I guess the temptation is to be more theoretical and to, and I've had teachers that explain things in a theoretical way. But the truth is most, most people relate to music very intuitively. Um, if you think about what's in your playlist right now, the music that you listen to, is it music that really makes you think or is it music that makes you feel? And most people I think would say it's music that makes them, that makes them feel, um, not exclusively. But, uh, and so f at that point it might be to um, drop the theory a little bit and um, how to create an experience that's a bit more um, immediate with people. So, 
uh, often that involves just putting an instrument in their in their hand and getting them to make noise and um, and see where it goes and to again be present with them and um, gauge what kind of uh, experience and reaction that they're having. So the the boot camps that you've generated for incoming students, can you talk about the um, the history of their creation and your objectives for students? So one thing that uh, we noticed, and I think maybe the the biggest um, challenge or opportunity um, as teachers, and maybe you can relate, is figuring out how to how to teach down the middle, um, because we we often have um, a bit of a disparity in certain skills um, and. Sometimes it could be just lack of access. You know, some students growing up may have had not have had the access um, to uh, to information or training or or whatever it it might be. And I see a lot of my students who are are quite self conscious about that. They come in and they're looking at other students like, "Whoa, this person's really got the chops that I don't have." And it's actually it's really it's interesting. I, I had students come in and say and actually center a person out and it's like that student <laughs> over there like they have what I don't have that student comes in and talks about that very student who was just talking like they have what I don't I wish they could connect and realize that we all have our skill sets um, and uh, and comparing to, your, to uh, yourself to others is it's hard not to especially at that age um, but it's usually a recipe for um, all kinds of bad feelings, and um, it's not always the most productive. Um, but in the, in the classroom, um, you'll often see that disparity. It's hard, you know, you've got some people who've had a lot of training, some people who haven't, and trying to, I think maybe in the old model, it was just, you know, okay, if you're, if you're here, you know, sorry, you know, and they would often get left behind. Um, and so I don't like seeing students get left behind. Um, I always feel like it's a missed opportunity. Sometimes all it takes is the smallest thing for that student for something to click and you'll see them, you'll see them move. And so it, it feels unconscionable to it, not at least, now the student bears some responsibility to show up, of course, but as educators, we bear some responsibility to at least try to address, try to figure out what's going on there and how we can bring them up. I also don't wanna see the students who are more advanced, um, you know, I want them to have a meaningful experience too. So it's just finding that, finding that right balance where, um, I'm creating the most meaningful experience for everyone um, that I can. And so the boot camp, in a way, was just a bit of a response to that because I realized one way that I could help the students who had less training coming in was to give them more training coming in or an opportunity for more training. And what I did, I think it was three or four years ago, I did a boot camp in the classroom. So what I said for the first, I think it was two weeks of class, I said, okay, um, I did an assessment quiz and uh, I said, if you're below this level, you're now required to be in class for the, the next two weeks. The students who are above a certain level, the next two weeks are optional. Um, and uh, which I had a bit, you know, I, I, I was worried about because I realized that's two out of 12 weeks and I was worried about sending students away. But just as an experiment, I want to see how it goes. What ended up happening is a lot of the more advanced students ended up staying anyway. So the attendance was still pretty good. And I just covered the absolute basics and I told the students who were a bit more advanced, like this is very rudimentary. Uh, but we're going to go through it to try to make sure that we're um, on as level a footing as we can be. And uh, what was interesting is that it was the community music program, and so I did find there was a lot of buy-in from the, the more advanced students. You know, they said, okay, no, this is, a, um, this is a good thing. It's going to raise the level of the classroom. It's going to help my colleagues. Uh, and they were on board, and they would actually, you know, they would help. They would step up, and they would also, um, those who were interested, I would get them into a bit of a tutorship role uh, as well. Um, I did, I, I wasn't crazy about having the time in class cut out for that, so the boot camp ended up being um, in the summertime. So we advertised it the year before to incoming students who were auditioning. We said, there's this, this six week classroom that's just a, um, it's a preparatory course to get you ready for um, uh, theory at Laurier in your first year. And so we spent six weeks just going through all of the basics just to kind of get them in a better place to, um, to, uh, to succeed in the first year. It strikes me as such a brilliant way to not only help the students to situate themselves relative to the curriculum's point of departure, but for you as an educator, because whenever we're building curriculum, we have to make uh, assumptions around prior knowledge and experience as a common frame that students can attach to and build from. Mm -hmm. So bringing people together uh, in that preparatory framework, whether it's two weeks within an initial course 
or before the, the program starts mm -hmm. is a good way for us as educators to know whether our assumptions around mm -hmm. prior knowledge and experience are well-founded. Mm -hmm. And also for students to kind of think through, okay, what is, what am I seeing in terms of my uh, my knowledge, my skills, mm -hmm. the integration of that, uh, and where I'm going to need to pay greater attention, work harder, mm -hmm. um, seek additional support, or uh, you know, spend more time in practice. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's a good reminder that um, we we shouldn't get inured to this idea that curriculum has a point of departure that's selected on the basis of our understanding of where they come from mm -hmm. as a diverse group of students mm -hmm. um, and then building them forward beyond that point. Mm -hmm. And also it's, it's a nice invitation for them to be more agentic in their own learning and mm -hmm. think about how am I prepared to succeed mm -hmm. um, and, and to create those kinds of social connections, that kind of community that's really gonna help them, mm -hmm. which is one of the things that our music faculty do so brilliantly is really create deep connections among the students and the faculty that uh, persist. I've seen evidence of that repeatedly in mm -hmm. just the two years that I've been here. Mm. Um, so I'm delighted to have this conversation with you today and to know a little bit more about your teaching practice already and just see such great things uh, coming for our students who are going to have the benefit of you as, a, as an instructor in the years ahead. It's really nice to meet you yeah, and you to have too. this chat. Thank you very much. My thanks to Colin Labadee for joining me today. And I hope you'll join me for more conversations that celebrate exceptional teaching practices, explore diverse teaching philosophies, and discuss the future of higher education, teaching, and learning.